for Northern Rockies Fire Science Network. And on behalf of our team and our partners, I want to welcome you today to today's uh, webinar, 10 Years of Post-Fire Monitoring, Learning About Soil and Vegetation Recovery. Today with us we have Pete Robichaud, Sarah Lewis, and Penny Morgan. Before introducing our presenters, I want to go over just a couple of webinar housekeeping items. At any time during the webinar, you can ask questions of me or of our presenters by typing them into the questions pane at the control on the <coughs> in the questions pane of the control panel at the right of your screen. Following the presentation, I will field any questions you have of our presenters. Um, whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the presentation, so feel free to type a test message or test your audio at any time. We are recording this webinar and the recording will be available on the Northern Rockies Fire Science Network website soon, at, at the con soon after the conclusion of this live webinar. And with that, I'll move on with the, introducing our presenters who in the fire community really need no introduction. Peter Robichaud is a research engineer with the Rocky Mountain Research Station's Air, Water, and Aquatic Environments Science Program in Moscow, Idaho. Pete has studied and modeled soil erosion as affected by wildfires, prescribed fires, and timber harvesting for the past 25 years. He is an international leader in post-fire hydrology effects and monitoring techniques. He leads various research teams, including the team that developed the popular web-based Probabilistic Erosion Risk Management Tool, or ERMIT, for post-fire assessments. Pete has published over 150 scientific articles, written one book, holds two patents, and still spends his summer chasing wildfires and playing in the dirt. Also with us today is Sarah Lewis, a civil engineer, also with the Rocky Mountain Research Station's Air, Water, and Aquatic Environment Science Program. Sarah has been with the Forest Service since 2004 and specializes in spatial and remotely sensed analysis of post-fire mitigation treatments and assessing the impact of post-fire treatments on soil and vegetation recovery. Also here today is Penny Morgan, a professor in the Department of Forest, Rangeland, and Fire Sciences at the University of Idaho. She has been with the University of Idaho since 1986. There she teaches prescribed burning, fire ecology, and science synthesis and communication. Penny's research focuses on fire ecology, but she also serves on the steering committee for the Northern Rockies Fire Science Network and advisory committee for the Great Basin, fire si Great Basin Science Exchange. Welcome, Pete, Sarah, Penny. Thanks so much for being here. All right, thank you, Corey. This is Pete Robichaud talking. I'll be the first presenter today. And I'm going to um, chat about what some of the big questions were that we had an interest in learning about on the, um, the school fire. Uh, the school fire occurred in 2005 on the Umatilla National Forest. And since it proximity to the University of Idaho and Moscow, we chose this as a fire site to do a, a lot of monitoring. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So 10 years of post-fire monitoring on this site. So let's kind of review what some of the big questions were at the time of the fire and um, some of the things that, that we'll be discussing today. So the, when the school fire occurred, it's a 50,000 acre fire. Uh, it started from um, uh, a tree falling on a power line and then the, uh, the fire took off and it burned um, in kind of a range, uh, lower elevation range type terrain, and then higher elevation forested terrain in the Umatilla. The Umatilla National Forest is in eastern Washington, uh, kind of on the Idaho-Oregon uh, Triangle border area. And this particular fire had a lot of um, uh, downstream values. There was a camp directly below the fire, Camp Wotan, and it also had the Tucannon River, which was a uh, which is a um, popular uh, fisheries river. So there was a big concern of trying to protect uh, the camp from um, severe erosion or debris flows, and there was also concern on protecting the water quality in the river. So this fire had a lot of firsts, and I want to just talk about those real quickly, and we'll get right into 
some of the things that we learned. So um, right now everyone's pretty familiar with the QuickBird imagery, and that's what you use when you access Google Earth. And this fire was the first fire that we actually had a QuickBird imagery immediately after the fire. It was also the first fire, a large-scale fire, that we did a native seed mix with local seed source. And then thirdly, this was the first aerial application of a wood uh, straw, which is a wood strand product, um, commercially applied after a fire. So it had a lot of uh, new things that were being uh, talked about or, um, you know, wanting to be tried on a fire. And again, because of the proximity to Moscow and the cooperation with the people on the forest, uh, we got to be able to do a lot of neat things on this fire. So with that, uh, we're going to move on, and Sarah Lewis is going to give you a, a little bit of uh, background about the burn severity. All right. Thanks, Pete. The school fire burned with a mosaic of burn severity. About 43% was classified as moderate and low severity. 43% as, I mean, unburned and low, I'm sorry. 43% as moderate and 14% as high burn severity. We established plots immediately following the fire in the fall of 2005. 79 permanent plots were remeasured each year for five of the next six years. Some of these plots will even be measured again this year as part of another project remeasuring burn plots approximately 10 years after wildfire. In the first spring following the fire, we did not find much industry vegetation, even in areas that had only been moderately burned. Many areas were covered with needle cast and charred blackness and bare soil and little else. In the first year after the fire, vegetation responded rapidly across the burned area due to favorable rains during the first growing season. In that first season, approximately 25% more vegetation in the form of low intensity rainfall fell, allowing for native vegetation and seeded grasses to flourish. By 2011, total understory vegetation cover averaged 50 to 70 percent across all burn severities and treatments that we studied. For comparison, total vegetation on these sites was close to what we measured on several unburned plots within the fire perimeter. A main incentive for our research project was the threat of invasive species moving from the lower elevation to Cannon River Canyon to the newly disturbed forested areas after the fire. We received funding from the Joint Fire Science Program, the Umatilla National Forest, and the University of Idaho to monitor fire effects, including weed spread, as they related to a variety of post-fire conditions. We implemented a rapid response assessment of burn severity and stratified our study plots across varying burn severities, tree densities as they related to fuel treatments, planned salvage logging, and post-fire rehabilitation treatments. We hypothesized all of these factors would affect the immediate and longer term vegetation response. Specific questions we were trying to answer for forest managers were, do bare hill slope mulching treatments affect weeds? Will seeding with grasses reduce weeds? What about pre-fire disturbances or the compounded disturbance of salvage logging after the fire? We saw a very successful native grass seeding um, application on this fire. The Umatilla National, fire, National Forest has a long-standing policy of partnering with local farmers to grow native seeds store them, and disperse them in places susceptible of non-native plant invasions, such as roadsides, logged areas, and after wild and prescribed fires. The seed mix applied after the school fire was Idaho fescue, sandbird bluegrass, wild rye, and a mountain brome. And from these pictures, you can see the first, the picture in May of 2006 is before the first full growing season. And then again, what we saw on the same plot measured in July, the grasses established quickly. And by 2007, the second, after the second growing season, we measured up to 80% grass on some of the seeded sites. 
over all seeded sites, by six years after the fire, we still measured an average of 30% canopy cover of grass species. After the second post, after the second post fire year, grass dominance decreased. We wanted to find out what the implications of this highly successful seeding treatment were for forbs, shrubs, and tree seedlings. Could they establish within the high grass cover, and could they survive competition? Other treatments that we monitored were post-fire mulching after the fire. One threat to ecosystem services after wildfire is soil erosion, with an associated decline in downstream water quality. In order to stabilize the disturbed soil, burned area emergency response, or bear teams, applied mulching treatments on the steep upper slopes of the Tacannon River. These treatments were meant to protect numerous values at risk, including, including the Camp Wooten Environmental Learning Center and a fish hatchery. Strategically applied mulching with wheat straw, wood strands, or hydromulch is used to diminish soil erosion and runoff potential following high severity fires. On the school fire, mulch treatments were concentrated on the steep slopes on the south edge of the fire. Four different treatments were implemented and monitored. Here are some photos of each treatment shortly after application. You can see the wheat straw mulch and the wood straw mulch have a fairly consistent cover. The seeding isn't visible to the eye until after it grows, and then the hydro mulch is it's applied aerially in a slurry that adheres to the soil, and on the school fire it was also combined with that native seed. We monitor the ground cover within each treatment twice a year to measure the persistence of the mulching treatments and their effectiveness at reducing erosion compared to untreated controls to assess the vegetation recovery related to each treatment. We were particularly interested in weedy and non-invasive species as they related to these treatments, as well as tree seedling establishment. So here are some photos a couple of years after the vegetation had a chance to establish. You can still see the wheat and wood mulch in amongst the vegetation. The seeding slide shows the successful grasses and the vegetation is abundant on the hydro mulch site. Um, obviously lots of vegetation coming in. So in addition to these field plots, we also wanted to monitor the vegetation and the soil recovery remotely. We used QuickBird imagery, as Pete mentioned, which has 2.4 meter pixels on the ground. So it's, it's high spatial resolution. And like he said, this is the same imagery that is used for most Google Earth applications. Remote sensing is often a very effective way to map and to monitor um, treatments and recovery after wildfires because of their spatial extent. Um, the image on this slide is a June 2006 image, nearly a year after the fire, but before a full growing season had passed. From this image, you can see patches of black, brown, and green, tr green tree canopies, as well as patches of bare soil, and it's either a wheat or a wood straw mulch. Is that really that bright color that sticks out well? against the blackened background. There was a large-scale salvage operation planned on the school fire. It spanned a four-year time period from 2005, immediately after the fire, to 2009. The lower elevation to Cannon River areas were harvested first, and the forested areas were harvested after litigation and as weather allowed. Logs were cut and piled with track filler benchers, and a rubber tire forwarder was then used to move the logs to a staging area. The majority of our field plots were salvaged in that first year between 2006 and 2007, but about 30% of our plots were cut in the following two years. Extending salvage logging over this four-year time frame made it more difficult for us to infer definitive changes in vegetation response, but we still have some conclusions that we will talk about in just a moment. Remotely, we used the QuickBird imagery to see if we could find the effects of the salvage logging or measure the disturbance of the salvage logging. The orange circles highlight um, 
on the left, you have a, an immediate one-year post-fire image where you see mostly black and brown tree canopies, and on the right, four years later, an abundance of green vegetation. The red circles highlight an area that was salvage logged. Again, you see mostly black and brown tree canopies on the left, and on the right, lots of exposed soil. You can see the road network and the skid trails that are a result of the salvage operation. This um, the disturbance exposed a lot of soil, and we were concerned about what would that additional disturbance do. On uncut sites, we found 40 to 50 percent bare soil on, on all the sites. After salvage logging, on the low sites, we found about a 50 percent increase, so up to 60 to 70 percent burn soil or bare soil, and nearly a 100 percent increase on exposed soil on the high severity sites. So we were very concerned that this increased soil exposure after salvage would lead to increased soil erosion and the potential invasion of weeds. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to, this is Penny Morgan now, and I'm going to talk to you about the uh, vegetation results. So we were, uh, as Sarah said, um, very interested to see one of the take-home was uh, how quickly the vegetation responded. More slowly on, on severity, where establishment was much slower, fewer surviving plants, and certainly open and harsher conditions. So let me talk about the graphs here, because I'm going to show you some of these uh, very like, uh, like this. Um, so across the horizontal axis, um, is the uh, time since fire for one, two, three, four, and six years after the fire, which is when we um, were able to be out there. We being uh, uh, many of our graduate students and their assistants. Um, and uh, on the y-axis is the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index, which balances both how many species and their relative abundance. Um, and the blue uh, trajectory here with the blue dots is the unburned, just for comparison. And I can tell you, though the data are not shown, just to simplify the graphs, I can tell you that the diversity on the low and moderate severity was very similar to the unburned. Um, so even immediately after the fire, um, well, within the first year. But notice how different the high severities are. So first of all, look at the, um, the graph on the right, which is the sites that were salvage logged. Those on the left are the, those not salvage logged. And you look at that bottom um, trajectory with open triangles, it was a um, high severity without seeding, and it had the lowest diversity in both, whether it was salvage logged or not, and quite a bit lower than the uh, high severity with grass seeding that was, um, had the highest diversity whether it was salvaged or not. And uh, the difference there, I think, where, the, where it was salvage logged, it was, there was a high severity burn, then they seeded, and then it was salvaged. And I think that the, um, the seeding added grasses that successfully established, and that um, changed the diversity significantly. We also looked at the veg same vegetation, but just in a different way by comparing, let's group all the grasses together and see what happened with those and all the shrubs. I've not shown the four results here, um, again, for uh, simplicity. But notice how, so this is grass cover on the, um, on the upper half of this graph um, through time, the same number of years. And you notice that uh, all of the, regardless of um, severity, the un, whether it's unburned, like the blue or the low and the moderate, even the highs are all very similar in terms of grass cover, and it was low, considerably lower. This grass seeding really worked. It was very impressive. And uh, even where salvage logging occurred, uh, grass was higher on the, um, on the seeded areas lower on the unseeded areas, and we see a delay in vegetation response of about a year, both in, on the shrubs and the forbs and the grasses. Again, the forbs are not shown. 
Um, with the shrubs, we saw something that I had expected to see more broadly, a really uh, consistent increase from very low and increasing through time. And we see that when we look at this graph here on the not salvaged, high severity. You can see that there's quite a bit more shrubs than in the unburned controls, which are shown as blue. And that um, that was true whether it was salvage logged or not, but salvage logging um, decreased the amount of shrubs present in terms of cover. We also looked at plants in terms of whether they re-sprouted um, after the fire. So these were grouped by their dominant pattern. So rhizominous sprouters think of pine grass. Um, and which was one of the species, or snowberry, another species that was quite common in our, um, our fires and our plots. And in the, uh, here I think that is striking is that the, uh, there were re-sprouts that came back, but they did never um, got to the same level as the unburned within the six years that we sampled. And that they were less where there was salvage logging, and certainly uh, less where there was um, seeding. We've been asked a lot about weeds, and here we've um, included. These are both native and non-natives, and it turns out mostly native off-site colonizers. So often we have uh, plants that establish from wind-blown seed that comes in from um, nearby living plants that survived the fires. So you can see that um, we did have more, as you might expect, more weeds on, or more uh, off-site colonizers on the high severity burns where there was more bare mineral soil. And uh, that that effect increased after salvage logging. So we had some increase with post-fire and then the salvage logging happened and then we got um, additional increase. Um, here the grass was effective in reducing the number of off-site uh, colonizers. So continuing with the weed theme for a moment, there was a lot of concern for weeds, and rightly so. If you look at that upper left, we know that after high severity fires or after um, harvesting that there's bare soil, and those thistles that Sarah's standing next to could be um, sending seed or underground uh, runners out into the bare soil. In fact, however, we found the weeds where there were weeds prior to the fire. So we did not see them increasing in abundance post-fire, uh, except in the places where they were already present, uh, sometimes old harvest units, sometimes skid places where there was a um, skid trail or a landing. In the last year that we sampled, which was in 2011, so it's six years post-fire, we were really focused on, in addition to the other vegetation, on tree seedlings. And I just have a couple of um, really contrasting pictures here just to um, show you some of the variety of conditions that were out there. Salvage logging machinery there on the left. On the top is a not salvage site, uh, which was a little um, north facing and so it had some uh, uh, abundant willows, but I can tell you there were a lot of seedlings under the willows and we were on our hands and knees looking for them. Uh, and then down here on the lower right are the areas that burned with high severity and then were seeded. In this case, uh, you can see where the people are walking. They, it was, the seeding was quite successful and the salvage logging removed um, quite a few of the trees, some of that were left um, fell over as well, and then beyond that areas that were not uh, salvaged. And so we wanted to know what happened in terms of tree seedlings. And we're focused on three different species, and so let me talk, to, talk you through these graphs. Um, they'll be quite similar on the next one as well. So first, um, ponderosa pine is in the left group, Douglas fir in the middle, grand fir on the right. The top is the tree seedlings per hectare. For those of you more comfortable thinking about tree seedlings per acre, divided by two and a half um, to get the tree seedlings per, um, per acre. And then um, we had both uh, low severity um, and low severity salvaged, moderate severity and moderate, moderate severity salvaged, and high and high severity, high severity and then high severity salvage. You can see that the tree seedlings um, were highly variable. How do we know that? 
you can see these dots are that we, in some cases we had very high low values and some very low values, but the, in any of these graphs, the box um, it contains most of the variable, most of the observations, observed values, and the horizontal line is either the mean or the median. So our conclusions, uh, moderate and low severity burns resulted in highly variable tree density. And in the high severity burns, we had very few tree seedlings whenever the distance to seed source was great. So once we accounted for distance to seed source, the effect of burn severity was much less. So to explain that a little bit, you know, in the, in the low severity burns, there's a lot of surviving trees. Moderate, there's some surviving trees. In high, the trees have been killed. And so this uh, source of the seed is, has to come from, in some cases, far away from the edge of the patch. And so this is the seed source uh, mattered greatly. That makes sense. So in the tree seedling data that I'm showing here, it's all not sites that were not planted post-fire. So they were dependent on natural regeneration. Salvage logging resulted in variable tree density. Um, and so sometimes as low as the site's similar severity that were not salvaged, and sometimes much more. Um, and salvage logging, also there was no significant difference in um, tree heights. So tree heights are shown there on the, on the lower graph. We were especially interested uh, about the effect of the seeding and the effect of the salvage, both independently and together. And so we focused in uh, more detail on the high severity in this particular part of the study. So we went to um, sites, again, you can see this is all about height. So where seedlings were present, how tall were they? I lost my mouse. There it is. Ponderosa pine is on the left, dug fir in the middle, grand fir in the right. And you can see the legend here. So uh, these are high severity only, high severity with salvage logging, the second one. Third one in each group is um, with both treatments, where we had both seeding and salvage after the high severity burns. And you'll notice that Douglas fir, we found zero um, Douglas fir seedlings, um, and therefore we were not able to measure their height in the high severity um, seeded. Even my graduate students weren't able to measure their height. Um, height in the high severity burns was not significantly affected by salvage logging, seeding, or both. And you can see that's partly um, statistically we were not able to tell the difference given the high variability. So take home message from this part. Salvage logging slowed post-fire vegetation response. The response was rapid. We think it delayed it by about a year. Um, and again, the salvage logging happened in the winter of 2006 and seven, most of it, and so that would have been after the first growing season, post-fire. Vegetation recovered quickly, um, more slowly certainly on high severity, and that was true whether it was salvaged or unsalvaged, that we had vegetation cover recovery quickly and that it was um, similar or salvaged or not regardless of severity. Grass seeding was very successful and hindered the establishment of the native forbs and shrubs to some degree, slowed their rate of recovery, um, and in, in many cases added to the diversity. They were local, locally adapted local native species of grass. In terms of tree seedlings, um, we did see fewer seedlings in high severity burns, especially where there was a long ways um, to the seed source, you know, for ponderosa pine, that the seeds fall from the mother tree like rocks, and so they don't uh, fall very far from the seed source. Um, tree seedling height and density was variable, and uh, not different in salvage seeding or both, even in high severity burns. Okay, to switch for a moment now to the, um, the next part of our talk, including first me, we'll talk about the vegetation response, and then Pete will talk about the soil erosion in the mulched areas. And I'm going to talk first about the species diversity. So before I showed you Shannon Wiener diversity, the t and that's on the bottom, the top is richness. And the graphs are quite similar to the previous ones in that we have across the x-axis, we have um, our observations 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 
well, we don't have anything for five because we weren't there, and six years post-fire. The species diversity was highest. Let's just focus over here on the, um, on the sixth year, just to make it easier to look at. And you can see that the blue is hydromulch plus seed. And you can see that that had the highest species richness at the top and also had the highest uh, diversity. And then if you compare all the other treatments, uh, to the untreated control, so we had some that were hydromulch and seeded, others that were seeded only, some that were wheat straw, some that were wood strand, um, and some that were untreated. So the two seeded plots were, um, are shown in blue and green here. And on the next slide, you can see that the seeded, um, the grass cover was quite a bit higher on the, both of the hydromulch in blue and the seeded in green than the other mulch treatments. And that stands to reason, given that grass seed was included in the hydromulch, was included in the, in the seeded only, but was not included in the, where the other areas were mulched. And it wasn't included in the control either. Um, Forbes um, were, cover was less on the seeded, so seeded only with grass, and, and on the wood straw, um, a little bit more on the hydromulch, which helps explain why there was such high um, species diversity on the hydromulch. Uh, the shrub cover, one of the reasons that um, picture that uh, Sarah showed you, and you walk onto the plots, and they look really different. And part of it's about shrub cover. Shrub cover was highest in those areas that were had wheat straw mulch, and least where they were seeded with grass, consistent with what we found on the um, other, the non-mulched areas that we talked about earlier. Take home from here. I hope you remember this one. Some bear treatments inhibit native vegetation response, um, and that was certainly true for the wood uh, strand and the wheat straw, while others change the species composition. We talked about how seeding with native grasses increased grass and decreased shrubs. And in these mulch plots, we found very few non-native species, nine total. I have two other pieces here to talk to you a little bit about the mulch before I turn it back over to Pete. And they relate to um, why. Why did we see these differences? And so when in the fourth year post-fire, we had um, Aaron Berryman, who's a soil scientist, join us. And uh, Debbie Dumrose also put in some um, uh, decomposition stakes, um, and we were able to look at both of those. We were really interested in does adding all this carbon, especially when you think about where the wood strands come from, they are byproducts out of mills, and so they've had the nitrogen removed, essentially. They're high in carbon, low in nitrogen, and adding that much carbon could um, tie up the nitrogen. To some degree, that could be true for the agricultural straw shown on the left, so that's wood straw on the right or wood strand in this case, and um, agricultural straw on the left. In fact, though, um, other effects of mulch, um, other effects of mulch uh, dominated. So we know from our gardens that um, mulch um, helps retain soil moisture, and certainly there was more soil moisture underneath the areas that were mulched with the wheat and the, and the wood strands, and there turned out to be 40% um, soil moisture as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Pete Robichaud, who's going to talk to you about the um, soil effects. Okay. Uh, so on the soil erosion piece here, the treatments that were applied were uh, to try to reduce the, the threat to some downstream values at risk and we're able to test these you know side by side so the wood straw mulch, the hydro mulch, the wheat straw mulch and the seeding and as I mentioned in the beginning that the uh, wood straw this was the first time that it was applied so I thought I'd tell you a little story of what it's like to apply something for the first time so when they showed up with the uh, with the trucks full of the, the wood straw and we uh, loaded it into cargo nets and the first two or three helicopter flights dropped the wood straw and basically it was like dropping a big bomb. It, it didn't spread out, it kind of landed in one big chunk and the only thing that we were saying, boy we're glad we're not near that when that came down. So then we um, 
consulted with the pilot and said, well, let's try a couple of different things. Let's try going um, a little bit higher in elevation. Generally, they were flying about 100 feet above uh, tree line. And so we said, let's go a little bit higher, maybe a couple hundred feet, and also to change their airspeed so that as they open the cargo net, that, that um, the wind from the, their speed would help uh, to spread out that mulch. And so it took us several trials, several trials, and then we finally got it figured out how to do that. Uh, so I think um, since that time now, all the other places where it has been applied and also some of the wood shreds, uh, we've learned that uh, with a heavier material, you have to adjust the uh, application uh, techniques that you do with agricultural straw. So anyway, just so you all know, the first place it was applied was here on the school fire. So I'm going to talk about the erosion piece here. And um, the, the thing to start with is a little bit about precipitation on this particular fire site. Uh, in the top graph here, I've got the total, uh, I've got the rainfall from the biggest storms that year. Uh, average rainfall in this site is about 1,400 millimeters, okay. Um, the first year, you look at the total rainfall from the biggest storm, and so in, in June of 06, uh, about one inch. Look at the rainfall in the biggest storm in the second year, three and four inches. So that's a tremendous amount of rain in a single event, and then also in that third year. Well, from an erosion standpoint, any of you have heard me talk before, the rainfall intensity is the important thing. So look at that second uh, graph or, and, um, in the 2006, in 2006, the rainfall intensity in that first year is about one inch, maximum 10 minute rainfall intensity. Pete? Whereas in the second year, we had big ones. Excuse yes, go me, ahead. This is Corey. Um, I'm not seeing your graphs of the um, rainfall? Am I supposed to be seeing graphs? Uh, tables. Tables. I'm not seeing those. Okay. I seem to be seeing the tables uh, okay with here. Okay, everyone else, there's other people seeing it okay, so keep going, Pete. Sorry about that. All right. All right. So, um, so the second table is showing that we had high rainfall intensities in that second year and low rainfall intensities in that first year and also that third year. Okay. Well, let's go on to see what that really had to do with the uh, responses that we saw after the fire. So here's a graph of ground cover and uh, three different colors that we have there are like litter is the brown, the green is live vegetation, the yellow is the uh, treatment. So if you're looking at that control, there's no yellow, there's no treatment. Here's that wheat straw it gave us, what, 80% cover that first year. And you can see how it started to decompose uh, in the years after that. And then here's the wood strand, um, gave us quite a bit of cover, um, and then the vegetation kicked in. But the thing to note here is that by year two, as I go across this, anywhere I go across, we're at 60, 70 percent ground cover. And we all know that that's that magical number that really starts to reduce erosion, 60 to 70 percent ground cover. So because of that response, um, that really had a big uh, factor in the low erosion rates that we measured on this site. Okay. So let's look at what those erosion rates were. And also remember that rainfall intensity that I talked about. So this is sediment yield on the y-axis in tons per acre. And then here are the treatments on the x-axis. And I'm comparing the first three years. So that sediment yield, uh, 0.5 tons per acre. Uh, those of you who have been in the post-fire environment, that's a pretty small number in our control. Uh, these erosion rates were very small. Well, part of that reason is that rainfall intensity that I showed you already. We didn't have a very intense storm that first year. If we would have had that, the uh, rainfall in that second year occur in that first year, our results would have been very different because an intensity of, um, 
uh, 3 inches per hour, 70 millimeters per hour, 10-minute rain, rainfall intensity, that would have produced some serious erosion on this site. But we were lucky. And the other thing that happened that first year is we had rainfall about every 10, 12 days. So it was actually ideal for the vegetation to get reestablished and for that seeding to get established. So the other bars on this, you can see that it dropped off dramatically um, by that second year. But again, this site, uh, very low erosion rates. So to put it into perspective, I'm going to show you a couple other sites, Heyman Fire in Colorado, Hut Creek Fire in Southern Idaho, Myrtle Creek in North Idaho, and then the school fire here on the Umatilla. And I drew that red line in at uh, 0.1 uh, megagrams per hectare, just to help you give you a, a good reference to compare. So all of the symbols that are here are the uh, measured erosion rates with different treatments. Control, straw, wood, over here, control and straw, etc. And you'll see that a lot of these values are above that red line on these fires, especially in that first year or two. But look at the school fire, well below it. Okay, so that's just telling us, yes, school fire was much, much less uh, from an erosion standpoint than the other sites. The other thing that we put here is these, uh, these bar graphs down here, and these are the rainfall intensities that are shown over here on the right-hand side. And the purpose of showing that is remembering that the rainfall intensity is the driver of our erosion. So on the Heyman site, as an example, you can see we had um, variety of different types of storms and some bigger events that probably occurred uh, later on in the years, uh, years five and six. Look down here at the school fire. Here's that first year, low rainfall intensity, and then those bigger intensities in that uh, second year. Okay, so again, if we would have had these intensities over here in this first year, our results would have been much different. So the other thing that this graph shows us is the uh, you know, the effects of these treatments. Um, so we have the control and the, uh, the hydromulch um, and the seeding are up here, and then here are the two other mulches, the straw and the wood. So we say, oh yeah, there's a significant difference in the amount of erosion um, reduction by those other treatments. So oh, that's cool. And then out here in year two and then in year three. And what happens is that uh, the seeding starts to kick in finally in year two, but it still isn't statistically significant, even though it's much less than the control, until uh, over here in year three. And you can see that that hydromulch didn't really buy us too much uh, from an erosion control standpoint, uh, never being significantly different than the control. But again, remember this site, everything was pretty minor in comparison to our other sites. Okay, so I'm going to kind of summarize everything that uh, we've discussed this morning, both from Sarah and Penny, and then some of the results that uh, I just talked about. So plant species diversity, a lot less on the high burn severities. Well, that means that the low burn severities you know, had, had a uh, much higher diversity. And the weed issue really wasn't that big of an issue, even though uh, it was a, it, even though it was a concern. We only found weeds in what less than 20% of our plots, and when we did find them, a maximum of about 2% of the total cover. So just not really a big issue, even though they anticipated it to be that. Uh, vegetation response across all plots, all treatments was really, really good. And again, favorable rain, especially that first year, key factor in that vegetation response. The native seeding did a great job. Um, yeah, the, the grass cover was was high, um, and that had you know that native seeding that they used. In retrospect, I think when we chatted with the forest folks, they said that the um, application rate of that native mix probably was a little <clears throat> too high. Maybe they could have done uh, less uh, seeding application and still have gotten really good results. Salvage logging effects. Okay, the veg vegetation response certainly was delayed. Um, it looks like it was delayed about a year uh, compared to the unsalvaged sites. And then the grasses. You know, grasses like disturbance. So because of that extra disturbance of that salvage logging, 
the grasses came in really well. Okay, sediment yield. I talked about that already. That the um, was much less on uh, this site compared to our other fire sites. That low rainfall intensity that first year had a lot to do with it, and the and the uh, the storms that came every ten days. I'm not sure what dance they did there on the forest to get that uh, rain to come every ten days, but that certainly made a big difference in the response. Okay. Um, no big uh, evidence of reducing that nitrogen availability or the microbial activity in the mulch area. But it certainly raised our concerns a little bit about long-term effects of these mulches. So I'm going to skip to that last bullet point right now and then go back up. So that ongoing work. So because of the uh, results that we learned here on the school fire and a concern that um, we want to make sure if we're doing these mulches today, that uh, 15, 20, 30, 40 years from today, we don't have an ecological issue that wasn't anticipated. So on the 2011 High Park fire in Colorado, we initiated a, uh, a study to look at the, uh, in detail, the effects of different mulches on below ground processes and that um, CN ratio, carbon nitrogen ratios under different mulch applications. So that kind of built out of the work that we did here at the school fire. And we'll be following that for the next um, several years, as long as funding continues on that. OK, remote sensing, really useful for monitoring the soil disturbance from salvage logging. And uh, this was one of the first applications of remote sensing for that purpose. And I anticipate that work will continue in the future, maybe even on an operational standpoint. So what are some of the conclusions that we can make out of this? Vegetation response was rapid. And it was dominated by those native species. So basically, this forest is highly resilient to disturbance, and it recovered very well. Seeding uh, with the native grasses was very effective. Uh, we certainly are, are seeing more native seeds uh, being selected uh, after fires, and we certainly hope that trend continues. Salvage logging certainly increased the bare soil, delayed the vegetation response, but it also increased the grasses. Remember, the grasses like that disturbance. So the mulching, it reduced the erosion, but also affected that veg response. Penny talked about that. The shrub cover height. Uh, with shrub cover was higher uh, with the wheat straw mulch than the other ones, and the grass seeding, although it did really well, also decreases the forbs in the shrubs. So um, there's a lot of people that we like to um, to point out who helped make this project happen. There were several grad students that came through uh, the University of Idaho uh, that really helped, and also the Umatilla National Forest and Washington Department of Natural Resources. So in 10 years, a um, lot of collaborators. We had three graduate students. They're all gainfully employed in the federal government. Um, many field trips have been out to this site due to its proximity to the university. Um, and these results from this fire have been shared uh, in a lot of different forums and, um, and, and, and publications. And in that uh, one-page handout that um, Corey put up, it would, has a list of the publications that are available uh, from, this, from this, this site. And then another thing to note is that several children were born since this project started. I also just like to thank the Uma Tiller, Monty, uh, Katie Clifton, Vicki Erickson, uh, the Joint Fire Science Program uh, to help make this project um, possible. So with that, I think we're ready to open it up to uh, questions. And I think Corey's going to work with us to help field some of those questions. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Penny. Thanks, Sarah. Um, that was a great presentation. It was so thorough and systematic. It looks like you didn't get a whole a lot of questions out in the field. But um, there is one, and I have a couple as well. Uh, one person on the attendee was wondering, did you measure snag fall rates or burned live tree mortality rates after the fire? I can answer that. This is answer that. This is I can answer that. This is Penny. No, we did not. We did not measure the snag falls. There have been some, um, but we have not quantified that. Um, 
my question, I have a couple of questions. One um, I thought of while Sarah was talking, um, and it was early on in your presentation, Sarah, when you asked, uh, or you said that there was uh, very little, when you went out early post-fire, there was very little vegetation even on the moderately burned plots. I was just wondering if you guys have any thoughts as to why the natural regeneration early was so poor. Well, my statement that there was very little vegetation even on the moderately burned plots was that came from when we were out on the fire in the fall of 2005 and then early in the spring of 2006 before a full growing season had passed. Okay. Um, and also, this is a fairly dry fire site, so the, the vegetation really needs that rainfall and snow melt to establish and grow. So that, that just hadn't happened by the time um, those pictures were taken. So a couple more questions from the field have come in. Another one here. In the last year or so, how did the wood straw or straw, straw bale bombs do? Are they decomposing well? Okay, this is Pete. And uh, yes, they are decomposing very well. So the, let, let's review the two or the three different mulches, the hydromulch. Um, basically, we couldn't find any evidence of that hydromulch by year two after the fire. Couldn't find it if your life depended on it out there. The uh, wheat straw, six years later, seven years later, you could still find some of that wheat straw out there. Uh, very decomposed, but there was still evidence of it. Now the wood strands, uh, here it is uh, 11 years after the fire, and Penny happened to be out there yesterday with some of her students, and she told me, oh, I brought you back a sample of some of that wood straw. So there it is 11 years after the fire, and there's still some of that presence. Um, when I was out there maybe two years ago and I pick up some samples of the wood strands that was um, certainly broken down, decomposed, uh, and uh, I wouldn't, you know, it takes a lot longer for that to, to break down, but it still will be. And, um, but that certainly sparks our interest in that long-term effects of these treatments. Thus, I mentioned how we're doing some work on the High Park fire, and part of that is to be able to look at that uh, long-term effects and detailed decomposition rates and changes in that CN ratio over time. You know, is that nitrogen getting tied up trying to break down that carbon in the long term? So um, stay tuned. We'll get back to you on that in a few years. Okay, another question here. Were there uh, weed sources nearby, or is this a relatively weedless area? Why do you think there wasn't a bigger problem with the invasives on their post-fire sites? I can, address that. I can address that. This is Penny. Um, there were, the weeds are mostly in the lower elevation grasslands. You know, so uh, many of you have driven through the canyon grasslands of this country, and you know that there's lots of yellow star thistle and annual grasses and other weeds. Those were, there was concern about those spreading upwards into the forest, and so there are weedy areas nearby. Where, but in the forest where the weeds, we found the weeds, it was mostly where there were previously established weeds, um, which tended to be in the places that were, had been more um, frequently disturbed. Sometimes those are recreational areas, sometimes they were areas that had been previously logged. Why there were no more weeds, I don't have a good answer for. Most of the weeds that we did see were kind of the familiar ones, although we did have some sulfur sink foil on some of our sites. Most of the weeds were things like uh, thistle and other non-natives like dandelions. Thanks, Penny. Can anyone speak to the treatment application cost differences? straw versus wood strand versus hydromulch? Uh, this is Pete, and I can be happy to chat about that. So let's um, review those, those treatments that were applied, and I'll do my best to rattle some numbers off the top of my head here. Uh, the wood straw, for sure, is the most expensive treatment that we applied. The um, 
purchasing that material, delivering it to site, and then uh, applying that puts that in that uh, three thousand to thirty five hundred dollar per acre range. Okay, the uh, hydro mulch would have been the next most expensive treatment. So even though the hydro mulch um, can be transported to a site pretty easily because you 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 purchase it in dry bales and you mix it with water. Well, the cost of applying that slurry is very expensive because you're, it's a lot of water you're, um, you're adding to that hydromolt mix and basically you're using a helicopter to apply that. So that treatment is in the $2,800 to $3,000 range. Okay. And then the third one was the um, wheat straw mulch. Now, when we did this on the school fire, I think it was around uh, eleven or twelve hundred dollars per acre applied. So that's getting it from the fields, bringing it there, and applying it. And oh, of course, it was uh, certified weed-free. But I will throw up that cautionary flag there for anyone thinking of using certified weed-free. Make sure that in your state, the the undesirable species are on that weed list. Uh, we had an issue where um, an undesirable species was not on the list, so they they met the letter of the law of the contract, but they still uh, applied uh, a treatment that had some undesirable species. So since 2005, the the um, the cost has come down dramatically. In Arizona last year, I think they were applying agricultural straw at $400 an acre. So $1,300, $1,200 down to $400, so a lot cheaper. And then the last one would have been the seeding treatment. Uh, the seeding treatment is in the um, $100 per acre range or 80 something in that category because it's a little bit more expensive to get a, a native seed mix than a, a another commercial mix. Um, so um, that tends to be the range of that. Then the last thing I'd point out is that uh, we, we have looked at making wood shreds on site. Instead of purchasing a, um, a wood mulch and bringing it to the site, on making it on site with the dead burnt trees. And we've done that with the uh, a lot of the roadside hazard trees that are often cut. And we, by using a tub grinder, we can grind up those trees, make a wood mulch on site, and then deliver that with cargo nets to the area that we have an, uh, an interest of applying that. So that's the latest uh, uh, strategy in um, uh, using a, a wood mulch that is a, a local source rather than a commercial source. All right, this will be the last question, another economics type question. Um, what were the economics of salvage logging and the cost of reseeding treatments? How did that work out? Mm. You know, I'm staring at Sarah and maybe you, you don't know that. looking blankly at each other. <laughs> so let me just put it this way that um, I, we, we don't have any numbers that could answer that question. Uh, the salvage was done for economic benefit, you know, that the, the forest had chosen to, to sell that timber. Uh, the bear treatments, they were applied immediately after the fire before they did any salvage. And the bear treatments were applied because of the high values at risk that we identified. So there was not a... Um, they weren't doing restoration treatments after the salvage uh, like what we had described. So these here were separate on, on this forest. And I don't have any numbers that would talk about uh, restoration after that salvage. Okay, thanks so much, you guys. Um, we've made it through all of the questions. And I just want to tell you how much I appreciated having our star-studded cast here today. Thanks for the presentation. Um, and for the attendees, I wanted to let you know that as you close the webinar, there will be a three, brief three-question survey that pops up, and we really appreciate your feedback. If you can uh, give that to us, please. And if you have any more questions regarding this webinar or have requests for future webinars, please email or call me anytime. Thank you.
all for your participation, and thank you, Pete, Sarah, and Penny for a great presentation. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, thank you, Corey. I'm off. Well, you're there. Wahoo!